now back to Melbourne to hear from Richard Alston, whose views I always enjoy hearing on most things. Richard's a former cabinet minister for the, for the Howard government. Uh, he's a former um, uh, high commissioner to London and a former president of the Liberal Party. Uh, Richard, welcome to Watercooler. Thank you very much, Nick. Good to be with you. I, I, I was going to say you, you're a person who's been through all this before, but I don't think anybody uh, has encountered anything like what we're seeing right now with COVID-19. No, I was just a bit after the Spanish flu epidemic, but um, certainly I think there are a couple of books that have come out on it now, which I think might be well worth revisiting. But the, the key point is, of course, that it was more devastating by orders of magnitude than uh, the current crisis. And, you know, people were just scared stiff for months and months for very good reason. Here, 99% of cases are mild. Uh, if you look at who dies, they're usually old people. There's the odd young one, which enables the media to sort of pretend that it's not just old, but it's the old 80 20 stuff. I would have thought 80% are either in aged care homes, so they're particularly vulnerable, or they're old and they have comorbidities, so a lot of them have a, suffer from obesity. So, you know, they, they were on borrowed time anyway. And uh, that's why it then becomes much more of a, an economic issue than a health issue. Well, that's right. I mean, I think Henry Ergas wrote in the report for us that he produced last month that, you know, the initial lockdowns uh, were, were warranted because at that stage we were working on projections of the number of deaths far higher than actually turned out to be the case. But now we know more about the virus. We have, we have new ways of treating it. And we know that the cost of the lockdowns is going up exponentially. Every day there's a lockdown, that's more businesses yeah. going to the wall. Yeah. At, at this stage, you'd have to say that from where we sit anyway, Andrews, the Andrews government has gone in far too hard at this stage. Yes, I think it's probably number one in the world for uh, stage four lockdown. Um, in fact, uh, the UK thinks it's, it's over the worst. And um, it, uh, Andrews doesn't seem to have any real concern about the economic aspects. He just he thinks of it politically and he says, well, people are worried about their health. But I'm not sure that's right. Once again, it's probably people on higher incomes can afford to take some time out from work, um, but people in middle Australia can't. And uh, if they're out of their jobs and they're relying on artificial subsidies, which are actually higher in many instances than their, their real wages, uh, they know that there'll be a price for all this and they're very worried about the financial aspects. And I just think Andrews couldn't care less about that. Um, to, let's move on to the performance of one of our major cultural institutions during this crisis. And I'm referring, of course, to the ABC. You were both communications minister and arts minister. Uh, and and uh, I recall you were a very engaged arts minister. I, some of your colleagues said that you're possibly a little too close to the arts sector. but. Um, and the ABC. Now, how has the ABC been helping uh, our arts sector during this crisis? Have they been putting on, you know, screen performances of opera, ballet, theatre? I haven't seen much. No, well, I think we, we're both very much aware that Michael Lynch, former CEO of the Australia Council, came out the other day and said it was a, a disgrace. And he's absolutely right. Um, the Charter requires them to focus on the arts. I mean, it's a pretty broad charter, but this isn't discretionary. This is obligatory. And yet, their only defence to what Michael had to say was, oh, yeah, but it's on all the other channels. Now, that doesn't cut the mustard. I mean, I don't spend my time looking at everybody's subsidiary of the ABC. I look at ABC One, and I've never seen any art stuff. But, it's, of course, it's overloaded with... Uh, you know, undergraduate uh, comedy shows and all sorts of other stuff that the commercials could just as easily offer us. But the arts, you would have thought, was natural territory for the ABC. I mean, they're into the culture wars. They should be very much culture-oriented. But no, for some reason, they just don't think it's mainstream. 
have always denied they're after chasing ratings, but that's all they ever do, actually. And of course, I suppose there's a complete lack of collaboration between our major arts, within our major arts uh, organisations, and the, the ABC too. I mean, we fund them both, right? We fund, you know, we'd fund Australian yeah. Opera, Opera Australia, we fund through the Arts Council, uh, yeah. and we fund the ABC. Now, obviously the Opera is in, in uh, difficult times at the moment, they can't put on performances, but wouldn't you think the ABC could say, well, great, we'll come and live stream something from Sydney Opera House, we can keep people employed, and we can bring, you know, great art to the people. Why well, don't they think well, of that? Yeah, I mean, the opera is now doing it themselves, putting streaming online, but um, if you had it on ABC, you'd be aware it was there, you'd go to it, uh, unless you're actually following the website of the opera, you wouldn't. And to me, that's 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 not satisfactory. The ABC is meant to be there for all Australians, and we all know it's got a pretty narrow focus when it comes to politics. But you would have thought, in terms of people's cultural interest, this is a must-have, and yet no, they um, they just won't go near it. They they they've tried a few things, but see the book club, the Tuesday book club. Now you know I might have agreed with most of the comments and critiques, but that's a very interesting thing to be doing. Um, there's an enormous number of books still being published despite the death of hard covers, so we were told a few years ago. And I would have thought that show is, is niche, but nonetheless, it's, it's very interesting to a lot of people. Now, this is what Radio National does, and in many ways I, I commend it, because they do have niche products. But uh, ABC television is just purely mainstream. They'll do anything that will get them a few more readers. And yet, as we know, in areas like their news and, and 7.30 report, their numbers are going down dramatically. I think you've written on this a couple of times. It's quite extraordinary. I think it's about 100,000 people less watching 7.30 report over the last five years or something. So, yeah, the, the numbers are severe. Um, I mean, but it you, makes you, no you difference pop- to them. You remember their response was, oh, well, we just need to educate our journalists, when, of course, the real reaction was get out a bit more, find out what the punters want, and you'll discover it. And, of course, both John Howard and Paul Keating pointed out that their news coverage is appalling. It's all about, you know, truck smashes on the Pacific Highway or, you know, the latest police round stuff, which they get for nothing. And uh, they can't be bothered even trying to match SBS, which has a good international coverage. Yeah, is there anything, you know, you're a communications minister, is there anything the government can do to, you know, oblige them to screen the arts? I mean, or are you yeah, just you totally powerless? You can, you can give them additional funding, conditional, but I'll give you an example. Back in my time, uh, I forget what provoked it, but there was a big fuss. They were obviously wanting more money, which they always do. And we said, you're neglecting regional and rural, so we'll give you 70 million, I think it was. Uh, And they said, right, yeah, we'll do that. We understand the problem. We gave them the money, and a few months later, I said, well, what's happening? And they said, oh, we haven't decided how to spend it. I said, what do you mean? Big spent in regional and rural? Oh, no, no, no. You can't tell us how to spend money. So this this is your problem. Now, you you can... There are other ways in which you can make funding contestable. So this happened in the, happens in the UK, I think. Uh, they'll say, well, here's a project, and you bid for it. So, you know, it might be historical um, pieces or it might be whatever else, a national interest projects, um, could even be current affairs. Uh, but you, you have an independent body to assess the quality of the bids, and they're the ones that went out. And, you know, they're time limited, so if you miss out first time around, you can come back in a couple of years' time. But if you just give people over a billion dollars to play with as they like, they'll always pretend they, they need more money. And as we know, the first thing they do is look at the most popular things and threaten to cut them. They don't end up cutting anything much, but that's what they do. So they just play a political game from start to finish. Well, from uh, political frustrations here to political frustrations abroad, 
Uh, yeah, I mentioned at the top that you as federal president um, uh, of the Liberal Party went to Republican conventions. So you know the, uh, a bit more, I think, than most about the dynamics of politics in the United States. Uh, how, in your view, is, is Donald Trump uh, as much in trouble as the media or some in the media would suggest? Oh, I, mean, I tend to think not. Well, you, you cannot engage in this discussion without looking at what happened last time. And as we know, last time, there were so many publications. I think there was one out of a hundred major uh, printing houses that said Trump could win. But essentially, people like Huffington and the New York Post and the New York Times, these all had... Hillary, you know, winning 90% or 98%. It was just extraordinary. So you've got to ask yourself, well, what has changed? Because really what happened like last time was that a lot of people didn't want to come out and say what they really thought about Trump. So they were the equivalent of our quiet achievers. And they have a very different agenda. See, the major media is concentrated in California and New York and Washington State, Washington, D.C., and, of course, those are three liberal bastions. So the Democrats prosper mightily in those places because they, they lap up uh, what they get from them. But the rest of the country has a very different mindset, and that's where I think you can't just judge on opinion polls. You've got to look at what it is that concerns people. And when I look at Biden's... Uh, proposals. I mean, everything is just costing an arm and a leg. Now, he may get away with it because right now no one's ever worrying about balanced budgets and we're all going to be in knee-deep in deficits uh, for the rest of our lives. But again, I think people uh, have enough wisdom to understand that you can't, it's not free money and it's going to be at the, it's not, not even just debt. I mean, Biden's not saying, well, that means we're going to have to borrow and borrow and borrow. He's saying, no, I'm going to tax you right now. So he's going to put the corporate rate up. I think it's from Trump got it down to 21. I think it's going to go up to 28. Personal taxes are going to rise, certainly on the higher income levels. Um, he's going to throw mega billions at all sorts of programs, like you know, free education for poor students, this sort of thing. Um, they'll get back into the climate change like there's no tomorrow. Uh, so the middle class works this out, that he's going to be a, the classic tax and spend Democrat. And in many ways, I also think they'll work it out that he's actually quite weak. I read something the other day that both he and Harris have no abiding values. What they do is they, they play the, the zeitgeist and uh, they're responsive to whatever is out there. So Harris worked out that the way to succeed in politics was to be extremely left-wing, like that other AOC uh, person from California. Um, yeah, it seems to me like, like the Labor Party here, they always seem to think that people are crying out for change and transformational change. Uh, but, you know, as we saw here at the last election, uh, yeah. most people are not so eager to change. Do you get the sense that that's going to do it for them in the United States? Well, that's where that's where I have my doubts because you, the way politics works normally is you will get big and transformational change where there's a huge problem, right? And if a, if there's a war on the horizon, people will sacrifice all sorts of rights and entitlements for the sake of winning. Uh, but where there isn't a defined major problem, and this was what faced Shorten, you know, he's out there trying to rip money out of uh, the middle classes, but he didn't explain why there was a need to do that. And all he was going to do was to throw it at his pet project. Now, Biden's pretty much the same. If he's throwing vast amounts of money at climate change, the, the middle class aren't going to be particularly impressed with that. But they're much more interested in where the funding comes from. And if it's coming from supposedly higher income groups, they know as aspirational individuals that they might get hit by this one day or that they'll lower the next level of tax marginal rate uh, or they'll just get, they'll get caught up because they move up into those rate levels. 
So I think you've got to, you've got to be very wary about uh, taking the poll seriously any more than we did last time. And, uh, you know, trying to make a judgment on these things. I, what I've learnt over the years is that the, the media is the least reliable guide to political outcomes because they're in the business of, uh, you know, colour and movement, plenty of excitement, they love novelty, they like new characters. Um, they're not interested really in, you know, tired old fuddy-duddies like John Howard and look, look where that went. <laughs> uh, probably they have the same view of Menzies, you know, dull and boring but actually delivered the goods. Mm. And um, that's where I think you've got to focus on who dictates the outcomes of elections. And there's absolutely no doubt that last time around, it was middle Australia. And last time around in the US, it was middle America. So what's different this time? Maybe COVID, but I don't think so. Uh, nearly all elections are determined by the hip pocket nerve. And um, people understandably are concerned about jobs and their families and their incomes and their lifestyles. They think that this isn't a major health issue. That's why they flout the rules in many cases, uh, because they know that if you're young, you're relatively immune. Uh, so why wouldn't you be worried about how you can afford to bring up your family if you're losing your job? <laughs> that's, that's, that's economic death. Well, we, at a time when we're not allowed to travel, but we can talk about foreign places, I'll just keep you on, the, on, the, on this for a second, uh, you're a former uh, High Commissioner to London, of course. Uh, it, on Britain and, and Brexit, and you've written and thought about this, uh, it, we've, we focus a lot on how Britain will manage outside the EU, but there's been a lot less attention to how the EU will manage without Britain and its powerful economy and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. Yes, well, of course, they lose the contribution. What if they, they wanted 39 million. I don't think they, they're going to get that. Uh, 39 billion, I meant to say, if I didn't. Uh, but more fundamentally, it's a question of whether their business model works. Now, it works to, to have a, a unified political system in the US because pretty much everyone's on the same page. Now, they might come from different countries and cultures, but they end up being nearly all America first people. In other words, there's a higher level of patriotism. People fly the flags all the time. Uh, and that's because it works. They have a single language, they have a single currency. You look at the history of Europe over the last 2,000 years, it's always been about warring tribes. And this is what sort of resulted in this massive overkill of the EU project. The France and Germany have been at each other's throats for hundreds of years, and people thought, well, we better not let this happen again. Well, I don't think it was ever going to happen again because everyone was appalled at what happened in Nazi Germany. So you, you haven't had a German leader who's for one moment wanted to go back down that path. And essentially, the, the EU project is, is what's called social, its focus is on social markets, not financial markets. Now, that is not the way to go. If you look at the most prosperous uh, countries in the world, nearly all of them are smaller, right? So whether it's Singapore, whether it's Hong Kong, even these days, Sweden and Norway. Uh, but there's any number of examples of small countries prospering more than the big ones. And what that means is that they're, they're more flexible. They can go their own way. They can cut their own tax rates. But inside the EU, you know, poor old Greece was just thrown under a bus in, in the interest of unity and solidarity, but it's killed the Greek population in the last 10 years. And uh, that's not how it should be. They should have been allowed to devalue. So I read articles now saying, oh, well, as a result of COVID, it's going to be much easier to integrate uh, the fiscal and political systems of Europe. Well, <laughs> that may be the case, but I still don't think it's going to be going to end um, happily for them. Richard, uh, I had one more topic to ask you about, uh, and that was Collingwood, but uh, <laughs> you'll be pleased to know we've probably run out of time at this point. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Pleasure, Nick. Thank you for entering it where you did. Ha, <laughs> ha,